How are you? Doing. Good. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Hi, Jay. Hey, Scott. Hello. Judy. Hi, Ken. And Jerry's brain has arrived. I don't know about Jerry. The brain, <laughs> brain is here. <laughs> How is everyone? Be right with you. Good. Good. A little depleted. I've been too too many things lately, but I hear you. Oh, Jerry's got the eye of Sauron behind him. Uh oh. Because does that bode <laughs> well? Or the world seems a little bit shaky. I don't know. It seems like <laughs> it's a mood thing. But, but if you remember, he, that means that he's closer to the objective. Right. Yes, but there's like a hellish time with a lot of small, <laughs> ugly creatures coming up. Yes. Where, where's your precious? And some very big ones. My precious is this thing called OGM. <laughs> Hope you're not going to oh. throw us into the into Mount Doom. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Hi, Pamji. Hi, Judith. Are you all right? A bit depleted, I hear. Just tired, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, 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 can't I, I think I'm declaring a staycation shortly after this call. Mm. <laughs> well, I have to get through okay. a webinar that I'm hosting tonight, then I can declare staycation for a little bit. It's 7 a.m. Right. for you guys. I mean, that's really, uh, I'm so admirable. Admirable? Oh. Yeah. Admiring like of that. the fact that you're getting up for 7 a.m. meetings. This well, it's is... 9 a.m. here, but I stay up pretty late. Although I can't compete with Charles. I, I can't figure Charles out. Charles doesn't it's... sleep, as far yeah. as I can tell. That's kind of what I feel. I actually sent him a note, said one on one time. I said, so are you up really late or up really early or you've just been up? <laughs> I think Charles rests in a box that has some dirt from Transylvania in it. <laughs> I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Oh, Ken. Hello. I have a pun for you, Ken. I was going to post oh my God. it, but I'm not good at it. I never do puns, but I like puns. Um, it says, alcohol and calculus don't mix. So drink, don't drink and derive. Ah, very good. Ken, have you ever heard that one before? I have not heard that one before. That's a good oh, one. No way. You should, you should post that. For those of you who don't know, on Facebook, um, when I was working for the census, I, I have run a group called Signs of a World Awakening, where I try to post um, positive Weird. developments in the world. And... <laughs> When I was doing crazy hours for the census, I didn't have time to read a lot. So I just started to, I've been collecting puns and comics for years and I just started to post them. And now I have a whole bunch of people who are tagging me on puns and posting things. And it's it's spreading like a, a, like a good vac bacteria. Um, so uh, if you have uh, puns you'd like to send along, befriend me on Facebook, it's Ken Homer and I'll put you inside the World Awakening and you're free to join in the fun. And the only oh. problem with that whole situation is that Facebook does not provide a groan emoji. I've sent out a picture of a groan button, however, which several people are now using quite regularly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're, you're definitely a groan punster. Yes. Well, I, I, it's, it's interesting to me how rapidly Neil responds with a pun. He's, he's quite good. He's lightning fast. I just had a little meme going of, of um, make a band edible. So we had the Rolling Scones and Merle Haggis and, um, you know, uh, Johnny B. Cookie and Chuck Berry Pie and uh, things like that. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what the new version of a memoir would be since it seems like everybody kind of needs one. And the closest I could get was memoir. I was just going to say that. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> good. I like it. Um, so let's uh, let's start our round of check-ins and see where we are. Uh, Jamie says she's in a really noisy place, so I'll, I'll wait for a little bit, and maybe she'll get into a quieter place. 
So let's go Julian Charles J. And Julian loved the Northern Lights. Thanks. Uh, unfortunately, since last week, I've been subjected to an absurd number of distractions and I haven't actually gotten any work done. So. Oh, that sounds good. How's, how's your world? Uh, well, actually, yeah, it's not quite true. We're trying to catch up on some emails and seeing all the good discussions going on. Like yesterday or, or the day before on the OGM mailing list, there was a, a good set of... Uh, well, because see, my primary objective is to be able to structure knowledge to the point where it can be viscerally manipulated. And there was some good discussion on the list within the last couple of days about tools to do that. Because so, there's a, a real issue. I mean, sure, there's ontolo ontological systems, um, you know, like RDF knowledge stores, which allow people to describe knowledge to a degree. But it, it's not, of course, nearly enough. You can't take human history and put it into what it was describable with OWL. I mean, OWL covers a certain number of things, and maybe it's great for the pharmaceutical industries, but it's not really uh, good enough to cover how to do knowledge. So we're still on baby steps with that. And that's why I was enjoying the discussion yesterday. So. Julian, what do you mean by viscerally manipulative? Uh, in that, uh, your knowledge becomes something it's it's not actually real right but it's there you can set you can perceive it and by by that i mean using some combination of your senses and your cognitive abilities and then same thing is that you can then manage it so that it's you are literally using your hands and your speech whatever your body can do to manage the knowledge instead of typing commands into excel or a sql database or, well, one of my one of my dreams about a future OGM platform is a, a little well. It's less my dream than it's a way that I try to light this up in people's heads, is to remind them of the Minority Report scene where Tom Cruise puts on the gloves yeah. and is busy like doing floop 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 floop, which I'm not a big fan of navigating through 3D information space, but that's just me. But but the idea that there's a common set of of something that's active that that is in the world that is multi-user. Right, because there, there is just Tom yep. doing floop, 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 floop. What if you have that with a couple different people, where the system each of them was using was adapted to their preferences, preferences about how to model reality, how to remember stuff, how to share? Um, oh, ab absolutely. Because you've heard terms like virtual reality and augmented reality and, and so on. And the thing about any of these, whatever you call them, realities, is that they are subjective experiences. So that while everybody has their own cognitive abilities, the way that they use them to sense and manage things is subjective. And and so if, if sorry, go ahead, Julian. Uh, so one thing is that uh, this this movie uh, Minority Report is a starter along what I'm talking about. An example I like to use is you go in, onto a website and you drill down. Right, this has been around for a long time. Well, to me, if you want to drill down. You would, if you were talking to somebody, right, in the collaborative sense, you would point to something with your finger and, and tell the other person, tell me more about that. And in my universe, that is the query to the database. It's not getting the mouse and clicking over here and clicking over here. It's you tell the computer, tell me more about that. And the other person, the, whoever else you're working with, sees that, right, and hears that. And it's up to the digital system to figure out that you are pointing at something, what you're pointing at recognize your speech that eventually translates down and send the system somewhere to a drill down. See, and this is visceral. And sure, using a mouse is visceral, but it doesn't relate to human cognitive abilities because you have to go through all these mapping models in your, in your head to figure out what I want has to be translated into these commands that the computer can understand. And to me, it's the other way. The computer should be figuring out what I, what I want. And I'll add two things to the scenario Julian just described, because you're describing also what I'm feeling as well. Um, one of them is that as you're manifesting in the middle of the Northern Lights, uh, the way you represent things, um, I can seize parts of it and then connect them into the way I represent things. So I can, I can sort of lasso in, for example, some something that's important that I want to remember, and then draw it, connect it, attach it, remember it in my uh, web of sense making somehow. Uh, and then 
The second thing is, uh, and this is growing increasingly important to me, that there's, a, there's an intelligent listener that's on my side, basically machine learning that is helping me. And yeah, I saw, I saw Scott Twitch too, it was good. Um, there's, a, there's an intelligence that's, that's listening uh, that is busy saying, oh, is this what you mean? How about this? I heard you do this. Can I, can I complete it for you? Can I send it for you? Can I basically, uh, as, as it gets to know you better and your preferences for how you manage that, your world, it's busy doing things ahead of you uh, so that you can get more things done more quickly. Um, so anyway, and, and it would be fun to have, I think at some point we need a call where we just sort of fantasize what these things are and then roll back a little bit and say, well, good, that means we need this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing. Because as we aim toward what an OGM platform might be like, that's those, these are the kinds of stories I'm keeping in mind because what I'd like to have is, is a, a place where machine learning experts can, can experiment with data we have available uh, that lets them sort of step in and figure out how that works. So, um, longish excursion, but but fun. This is this is this is the stuff that animates me for for why why I'm here. So Charles J. Lauren, uh, did you want to add something, Julian? Uh, no. Okay. Could you, this well, is yeah, good because you, you were you were just describing that it's technology it leverages is to leverage the human in a subjective way. So augmentation, human augmentation yeah. system, slightly angle bardian. Um, sorry, Charles. Go ahead, Charles. Hello uh, on this. I'm just. I'm. This is totally why I'm here. Um, and yeah, Jerry and others might know. I, I kind of also dreamed about this immersive mapping stuff. So I'm really eager to to go into that and learn more what's going on and, and the possibilities. Um, <clears throat> and in, I've I've been on, on this kind of odyssey of of uh, mapping and harvesting, and it it, it occurred to me that. Um, Kind of my recent extension or, or upgrade of um, of role from Map Whisperer is Map Warrior, and um, that means literally fighting with maps. And yeah, what does that mean? It means both both ways. Um, <laughs> so that's me. Um, yeah, on this journey through the Valley of Harvesting and uh, dealing with the tech and the inter and lack of interoperability, or just staying the course, just keep breathing. Um, that's me, the map warrior these days. Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, <laughs> Jay Lauren Rimmer. Uh, thank you for setting the tone, Julian. Um, so a lot of my work uh, this week has been in taking all of the kind of leadership, storytelling, coaching work I've done and trying to democratize it and figure out how it can be spread um, to everybody, so not just to the top level of the top level people that are getting on the biggest stage, but in the recognition that your stage is everywhere now. Um, and so I've been, I just released my journal for free and um, a, a downloadable form and um, just been kind of spreading the word on that. And um, so what's interesting for me about what Julian said is that I've thought about when you think about your landscape of stories, if our stories make up our lives, um, I, I, I've often thought like, what if it could be that your stories don't live here, right? They don't live here as the solution, but they live here as the solution, which is the ancient solution, right? So it's like some combination between a memory palace, um, hieroglyphics, sign language, um, you know, like what would be the best design solution so we could embody by triggers and remember these stories and be able to hold them. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm calling that knowledge. So like, we'll take the tech part, very, very important, but for now, put it over here. And what does the full embodiment look like? So that's my check-in. That's a full head of check-in. Um, and also, uh, <clears throat> your mission to democratize your work on storytelling is a really, really OGM -y mission. And I would love, let's set up a pop up call where we can convene some people who'd like to help you do that. And let's see if we can put some, some rocket boosters on, on your mission uh, and see what that means to you and what it means to, you know, to some of us and how we, how we do that. Because that's, that's, we're on the list in particular, we're sharing a whole 
bunch of solutions and issues and, and you know, watch this and watch that. And, and that part of what I think we need to get to is the meta part of it, of how do we, how do we get great solutions out in the world? How do we weave them into different usable contexts uh, the way that we were just sort of riffing on with Julian, et cetera. So it's really um, totally central. Thank you. Uh, Lauren Romer Doug. Hi everyone, it's so nice to see you. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, just uh, Charles and I are just getting super specific about um, kind of processes we're uh, developing and trying to see how we can take all this meta stuff that, uh, you know, all these experts that are in this room and um, kind of design a process where we can um, take certain steps and see how we can just kind of jump in and um, start uh, doing stuff and kind of augmenting, trying to create a community of impact where we can augment um, all the stuff that uh, other people are doing. So basically the, the essence of our design is to kind of reward the first follower and people when you try someone else's um, idea or you listen to their presentation, you give feedback on the paper, that's what we're uh, rewarding in this network because it's not just, you know, we already have all these great ideas and big thinkers and visions and stuff like that. But what we all need are people willing to try out these ideas and to have a network of people, you know, who will try, you know, Rex Labs or, you know, this kind of facilitation or these new things. Like that's, I think what we're really lacking. So that's, um, we're getting really serious and talking about, talking to, um, you know, currency experts and stuff like that. And actually like just designing the first implementation of this um, uh, network. So we kind of take entrepreneurs through um, this process. So yeah, that's what we're doing. We're really excited about it. And we have the harvest party on Monday. So that should be really fun. And that's right, that's coming up and Thanksgiving is coming up and all these things are just rushing upon us at the end of the year. Right. And here in Portland, it gets dark ungodly early already. Um, thank you, Lauren. Uh, Romer, Doug, Judy. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, nice to be back here. Um, I got a chance lately to uh, read uh, Otto Sharmer's uh, book of Fury You, and I'm just grateful for the group, you know, kind of leading me towards uh, Otto's work. And it is definitely uh, something for me. So hopefully I could pay it forward moving along. And uh, it really kind of sink into me in terms of uh, uh, a better awareness of the different levels as you communicate or as you engage with a group. And uh, yeah, it's, hum it's a humbling, uh, 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 I would say, experience for me just to realize you know, how, I how I get stuck with certain levels on his work. And yeah, it's kind of <laughs> looking back Oh my goodness, what have I done? <laughs> so uh, it, it's, a, it's a great work and uh, thank you for leading me the way towards that. Um, Romer, thank you. And, and Otto's work and his, the whole community they've created around Theory U runs really, really deep. Uh, and they have the Presencing Institute and they, they do consulting for companies and companies listen to them and follow what they're doing. And what they're doing involves emptying and dealing with your dark side and, and a whole bunch of stuff that most normal corporate consultancies never get close to that I can tell. So, uh, so for me, uh, Theory U and that whole, that whole sphere of, of activity is really an important sort of potential partner for us and so forth. And we're connected to Otto. Otto was a guest on a call I ran a couple of years ago. Uh, we have many other connections to, to Theory U community, I'm sure. Uh, Kelby Bird is a friend and she's the, the sort of their facilitator uh, in the middle of all that, she does a lot of the drawings, a lot of the artwork for Theory U on black background with gold and silver and stuff like that is, is Kelby. Um, so I, 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 I want to build some, some links over to Theory U at some point that are, uh, that are sort of robust. And, and, and also then, uh, and this is part of what being OGME as a verb might mean, how, what, what about Theory U do we absorb into how we work? Like, like what aspects of what they're up to uh, should we absorb and, and adopt? and uh, adapt ourselves. So, 
thank you for bringing that uh, up in the conversation. Thank you, uh, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Doug, Judy, Parmji. Okay. Um, I think I'm unmuted. You are um, fine. We hear you. As some of you know, I've been working on this book called Garden World Politics, and I finished the draft, which is published up on the Medium, and I put a link in the chat for that. Uh, and uh, my big quest now is to find a publisher, although there's questions as to whether books even make sense in the current climate. Um, my key client these days is the Institute for New Economic Thinking, George Soros's organization. And uh, my task has really been to nudge them to get out of the mathematical way of thinking uh, into more narrative way of thinking. And we've been making some real progress. Uh, and that's pretty fascinating. A long story, but it's enough for now. Um, thanks, Doug. Um, and uh, since I seem to be riffing on what everybody's saying here, um, one of the really interesting questions in the OGM uh, thinking space is what happens to books? <clears throat> like what, what, what is the next communications medium, right? Um, and one of my problems with books is that they're kind of monolithic and they're protected by digital rights management software. And it's hard to refer to a paragraph in a book, right? Uh, so I use a little app called Readwise. I think that's the one that does this, uh, which basically picks up your Kindle markups. I, I, I try to buy Kindle books when I can now because I don't have room for a big library. But then, and then I use the, the highlighter and if, if things that I highlight show up in Readwise, but they're not really useful in, the, in my world. I don't, I don't have a way to integrate them in what I do. And allegedly the best ideas in our world are buried in books because people who care a lot about stuff write books. That, that's, our, that's our medium. So how do books live in this new world? How do they get deconstructed, riffed on? How is their content made more, more richly available? Because one of the things intellectual property overprotection does is it cuts the ideas out of the world in order to protect the author forever. And I, I don't think that's a great idea because I think that these great ideas ought to be remixed, harnessed, reused, etc. So, so how does that, what does that look like going forward is a huge and wonderful OGM question. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I think one of the challenges that I just, maybe just to put on the board as, you know, the name with this is that a lot of research shows that when you read a physical book, that your ability to absorb the information and understand it and to recall it is exponentially higher than when you read something in a digital format. And I think um, some of the reasons that neurologists think that that's the case is because of um, the way in which we have like almost like physical proximity of ideas to each other and that you don't get as lost in where you are in space and time as you do in these digital models. And so I think it's, it will be interesting to see how you get the superpower of digital, but the tech, you know, the kind of this tactile, you know, um, kinesthetic almost appreciation for the, you know, the physical. So it's just something to think about. Love that. And, and there's something about opening a book and the ritual of using a book in our culture that slows you down and makes you focus on one thing. And there's, you know, there's questions in, in the world about is long form writing going away? Is the book obsolete? Is writing itself obsolete? Those were all kind of questions that have, that have been around. Um, and for me, one of the questions is how do we create a system where we can have our knob on the focus dial, uh, meaning uh, at, at one moment we put it on fast, at another moment we put it on slow. When you're on slow, everything else goes away. It's like one of those focus apps where all the other apps just dissolve away and you only see one thing and you have a, your, your ability to focus on one thing is improved because all the little notification buzzers and dings go away, you just focus. And when you're going fast, um, it's a little bit like Bruce Lee being attacked by multiple people in, a, in an early Hong Kong action cinema mm -hmm. movie where these things coming in at you are stimuli, messages, tweets, in, but important things and how you deal with them, how you use their energy to forward them to the right conversation, to annotate them, to mem memorialize them, to, put, you know, to weave them into context, to do that extremely quickly and efficiently is a really important aspect of how we do our work. And for me, it's not that long form is dead and, 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 and uh, multitasking is impossible. And I, I, I don't really like all these narratives so much as why don't we tune the tools so that we can turn the dial 
so that the system helps us deal with things quickly and efficiently or slow everything down and focus deeply in one thing. And if the system can be our assistant in that way, uh, then I think it's a big win overall because we get to choose which of those modes to be in and, and conscious choice about how to use media and whether to turn the damn thing off or not and all of that is, is hugely important here. In our yeah, world. that's the thing is that the, the system needs to leverage the human. Yeah. And uh, one, one concept I've been working on since people have bugged me to write books is that, well, is a book still adequate in the 21st century? And I don't think, not necessarily that it's obsolete, but I don't, I think that it's no longer adequate. One of the reasons I'm stalled writing a book is that every time I try to linearize what I'm thinking about, I realize that everything is deeply intertwined and I can't come up with an outline I love. And so there's probably like five books in my head that are not making their way into the world because, because the way I see it, everything is so intertwingly uh, that I'm much happier weaving the ideas into my brain and then narrating a story through the brain. That makes me totally, right. exactly. This is the new gesture. Yeah, uh, so one thing I've been looking at is if, uh, if you, uh, uh, Julian, you think of Okay. The if you paradigm think of that I says, used in, in structuring the book, uh, the paradigm that I used in structuring the book that made it easier was to put it in the form of where are we, how did we get here, what can happen, and what should we do? Which sounds a little bit like a journey curve, but who knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> Julian, go ahead. Uh, so I was going to bring up Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five, which is completely against the idea of non of uh, linear. So. But, uh, but yeah, this, this idea, uh, well, I mean that, you know, Slaughterhouse-Five was presented as a bunch of bubbles. And so you had to assemble it in your mind. This gets back to the whole concept of, of uh, the of uh, mapping. But what Jerry was saying about how this is related to that, and how, how do you tie that all together? And um, I was going to mention, uh, one of the things I've been working on is history. History is a graph database. So that uh, the thing is, if when you study history, you find out that, well, a book presents it linearly, but when you look at one of the events, there were things were going all over the place. And in fact, I'm giving a lecture about this at the Neo4j developer conference in two weeks about using graph databases to represent history. So, um, thank you. And uh, I'll go back to, I'll, I'll do a little brain sharing at the end. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Um, so I, I'm, I've got this uh, experimental course I'm leading for founders. Um, it's all people that I've already coached and I call it mythic moments. And we've been kind of like following various continuous journey curves. And each time we're gathering these essential stories from our lives and kind of coming to the present, going to the future, going to the past, playing with time. And what, what really comes up for me is that as my wife is a podcast and radio producer, as you know, Jerry, um, I keep on coming back to this like, okay, now we've got all these stories and they're essential stories of our lives, of our leadership, of our, of our essence. We could even build them out. And there's a something that you can make from this. There's a something that, that it, it's like an almost book that would be very prevalent for, for so many people, like, because I know it's not just, of course, the stories, and it's not just what you derive from the stories, because there's also your essential studies, your brain science, your, you know, your research, right? So there's like different components, but that's a piece of it. So like, it's very, it feels like we're just on the precipice of some kind of like, next level living book thing that seriously, I think, like, I need one. So I'm just like, okay, I'm just gonna have to do one because I'm tired of talking about it, but like, I just want to bring that idea. Um, I want to build that here. <clears throat> like this is, this, is, this is the lab in which to play with that and to experiment with it. And, and I think, one of, I think uh, as we're forming up quests in the way that Matt was describing uh, in our last couple of calls, um, I think there's a quest here for the future of the book or the future of how we communicate with each other, how we tell stories, how we memorialize, how we share, how that all connects, because we, We've been stuck with a, a series of units, units of nuggets, you know, standard nugget sizes. There's the book, there's the tweet, there's the blog post. Uh, they're not very interconnected. They're not very woven together. And, and like blog post and tweet are brand new in the, not, in the last 20 years. These are, these are some of the semantic affordances of the web, right? But the web ended up looking kind of like a magazine, right? And, and, and efforts to hypertextualize, efforts to contextualize and all that haven't really gotten very far. We have a very, very, um, clumsy, primitive 
uh, way of sharing information through the web. And a piece of what OGM is really about is pushing that, that, that boundary uh, toward useful things that are kind of intuitive, the way that Julian is describing. Like, like how, how do we make it, you know, how do I make it so I don't have to learn a new gesture vocabulary and train myself to do specific, you know, because because you can easily see that that like the, the, the Tom Cruise Minority Report interface might require a whole bunch of training and internalizing, and that's not going to work because 18 people are going to learn that and the rest of us are not. So what what is it that's very useful that way um, that that winds up becoming a normal way for us to interact. Uh, and, and, and for me, it's like I'm having this weird, weird experience where I'm note taking all the time, but I'm note taking into the same mind map. And it's insanely cool and fun and useful. And I'll, I'll do a little bit of screen sharing in a sec, but I want to make it through the, um, the check-ins. But, but it's, 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 like, it's a joy to take notes in this environment because as something shows up that, that, that's important, I'm clicking it into the place where it belongs, where it feels to me like it belongs because it, 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 it offers more evidence. It, it, it lights a little bulb about something that I care about, which I'm hoping somebody else cares about because I share my brain out. So yeah, so it, it just keeps getting better and better. Um, Judy Prunjit Scott. Wow, what a stream. <laughs> um, I'm in a fractal stream, I think, because I'm carrying too many different things at the same time, all of which are exciting and moving in increasingly interesting and yet sort of slightly diverging directions. And I'm, as I mentioned in the front end, I'm kind of ready for a staycation to step back for a little bit and try to integrate across those multiple layers to get the wholeness back and then re-enter the work stream. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I'm feeling the same way. Too many oars in the water. And then when one of them catches, you're like, whoa, because it spins the, spins the little boat around. Um, I have, I have a com one comment though, because I think I'd like us at some point to, to talk more about definitions of quest because there's the mythic quest and for some of the things that are OGME, quest is too long-term and vague and might be like Don Quixote. Um, yeah. And so the, there's sort of this balance between the infinitely wonderful and the pragmatically achievable and where do we play on that huge continuum. Um, Probably one of the more exciting things this week was a follow-up call on our group from the workshop. And more to say on that later when we've got our heads kind of screwed on straight, but we're working on some stuff. That sounds great, thank you. Uh, Pramjit, Scott, Jamie. Gosh, I'm interested in what I'm gonna say next. <laughs> so things. Um, there's a lot of stuff going around about the term narrative. And we had a conversation before about when you're trying to find the truth and everything gets flooded and then you don't know what's the truth out of everything that's kind of in front of you. And I just feel that um, there seems to be like a surge, like a wave coming up of truth narrative because people are they're seeming to become aware that, do you know what, if we just sit here and, and wait for somebody to come and do whatever needs doing politicians it's just not happening things are getting worse and so they're they're kind of stirring now and, and they're looking at narratives and they're kind of um coming together and saying stuff in a way that's changing what the narrative is out there so that then if people start to hear that then they start to also become more aware of how does that relate to them and it, and it works on so many different different levels from um the level around kind of who am i am i part of society or part of religion or whatever or, or am i something different and where are the overlaps so there's all of that going on um and then there's the all the stuff about um organizations you know uh, what and, and groups and community groups and, and what are the truths that they've been following and, and acting on up until now and what are the truths that actually are truths and, and, and like 
racism is, is a result of so many things being missed out of the, of the actual narrative and, and so is sexism and so on. Um, and so, and I think that then it kind of builds up and builds up into systems and so on. Um, so I'm not really sure what the end of my blurb is, but that, you know, there's a kind of, there's a whole wave that's kind of coming over. And I guess my, I see my role as being a bridge between, because people are going to pick up different things from the wreckage and everything. And in the past, I've kind of seen something that I see as a solution, like an idea or a report. And I'll go, hey, guys, look at this. It's, it's a solution. And most people around me will just look at the same thing and, and like shrug their shoulders and say, I don't really understand because <laughs> they're not making the links. So it's like it's presenting the right thing at the right time in front of the right person. And it's there's a lot there to think about. And I'll leave it at that. Um, that was really rich and just to riff on what you're saying, a couple of things. One, um, I my own belief is that we are deep in a nonlinear war that po that there are people taking us into the post-truth, post-fact world on purpose because it lets them run elections and win big political games and gain power. And that the media is like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We were, we were all about like democratizing and making equal, easy access to information. And we've suddenly been used in this other way that the, the media and the social media platforms don't understand what just happened to them and how to fight it back. They're trying. Um, and all of this is a battle over the scripts that are running in our heads, some of which are installed there by religion, by our early socialization, by other kinds of things. And then one of my favorite little sort of cultural nuggets about this is a song from South, the musical South Pacific, which is you've got to be carefully taught because yep. South Pacific is about racism and the song basically says very sweetly, we're not born racists, we're made racists by our families, our cultures, right? And, and all those things, sexism, racism, and all that, our scripts in our heads are, are kind of installed there by, um, by things that happen to us that, that in many cases override actual experience and actual nature and actual observation, right? A lot of these scripts run counter to what nature would tell us if we actually stopped and slowed down and paid attention. Like you realize like all humans are equal and we all deserve like attention and let's move forward and make things better. But there's a script that says, no, 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 those people over there eat their young and they have green blood. So, so stuff like that. So th this, is, this is really central to, to OGM. What, what you just sort of went, went and riffed on in different ways is, is I, I hate to say it, is equally central to OGM, um, which sounds like, like nothing is central, but, but, but this is like a hologram we're looking at, right? We're, we're each taking a different look into the big ball of wax. Judy, then Doug. I was just going to say there's a, a whole neuropsychology thing on that too, in terms of the mapping that actually occurs in the programming and that scripting can happen from toddlerdom on. It's essentially as soon as there's cognition and experience, the mapping is starting to occur. So the interventions later after the mapping have occurred are very difficult. Totally agree. And, and, and how humans are softened enough to change is an essential question here, because if those circuits are, hard, are get burned in and are impossible to change, we're all hosed because a lot of people have a lot of circuits burned in a, in a really hard way. Doug, Jay, Ken. So I've been thinking about the word truth in relation to the Trump followers, and I've come to the following. The word truth originally was troth, as in I pledge thee my troth. The word truth was used as a quality of relationships between people. And I think that the Trump followers are a lot about relationship in that sense. They have faith with Trump. Whereas for the progressives, to pigeonhole a little bit, uh, truth has to do with fact. So you have a fact world and a truth relationship world, and they really do not go together very well. But putting it that way helps us understand both sides, I think. Um, I wish you'd said that to me 20 years ago, Doug. That's really, that's really useful. Um, that's really useful. Uh, sorry, uh, Jay, then Ken. And then we'll go back to the check-ins. Thank you so much, Doug. That's wonderful. I'm a kind of uh, addicted to uh, etymology. Um, and I've been kind of struggling. If you look at my first webpage, I'm looking at is 
Trump is a great storyteller. And I was looking at the different articles that were talking about that and why and what they were referencing specifically. Um, and I think that, you know, because I just like stop the steal is like so journey curve. It's like, here you are, you know exactly where you are, you know exactly what shared knowledge you have, you know exactly where it's going, as opposed to, I'm not even sure what the other opposing narrative is. It's, it's just a reality, it's a reality struggle. But what I was gonna say was, maybe what we're gaining here, the gift of this is a kind of, um, it's not just, it's not about we need to wrestle facts, but rather we need to understand subjectivity. And that's what is the gift of this because we're just, it's just going by and we're calling it, oh, dummies, idiots, they don't know whether, yeah, it's like, no, it's a shared reality, which is an immersive story, which is told from a thousand perspectives. And if you are just perfectly, like you said there, Doug, like if you're calling truth this, if you're confusing truth for fact rather than truth for a relational uh, shared understanding, then the boat has already left. Truly insightful and useful for our present moment. Um, Ken? There feels to me like there's a tie in here to the uh, documentary movie, The Corporation, where they're talking about branding. And, you know, essentially branding is owning parts of your brain. Corporations want to own, a, they want when you think of laundry soap to automatically think of Tide, or when you think of, you know, uh, mayonnaise, it's craft, whatever it is. And, um, you know, the, the history of advertising is, is very closely coupled to um, psychology and in a very, in a shadow way. And it feels like now, you know, political consultants and, and media consultants and advertising have all come together in this, battle of are we going for the evidence-based narrative or are we going for the narrative that that controls the brain so i just was as we're as i'm listening to all this stuff that's just sort of popped in of that feels like a an intersection point of um you know the, really what we're doing about is what we're looking at here is a, a kind of a branding of we want to own people's brains and automatically make them think hey you're being, you're, you're being, um, your position's being uh, usurped. You know, the, the election's being stolen, even though the evidence says otherwise. Um, yes. Uh, so let's go back to our check-ins. Scott, Jamie, Pete Kaminsky. All righty. So, you know, something that almost never happens with this group, the thought that I had at the beginning has managed to come back again. So what I was going to say a while ago is actually directly still on point. So I'll make this quick. All right. So I've been synthesizing my thinking tools for kids. And I made a major leap, which I talked about a little while ago, about moving from 30 minutes of content for a 30-minute session to five minutes of content for a 30-minute session in the sense that I'm not the one imparting things to you, you are actually constructing your own knowledge, you are building your own knowledge, and that that's actually much more effective. And that's something that Jerry, you referred to, how do I plug this into my own brain? Because if you can't do that, then it doesn't make any sense to you. So that led me to think about sense making. And I've been thinking about the ethics and effectiveness of attempting to make sense for someone else versus creating the conditions and environment that enable, encourage, and promote their own sense making. So that relates to Jay's comment about 7 billion perspectives, right? And what I landed on last night at four in the morning when I woke up thinking, which I often do, I found this thing called visual thinking strategies, um, BTS, which is using art and three questions to facilitate individual sense-making development, developing that skill. Here's the three questions. What they do is they put a piece of art up in front of you, in front of the individual, in front of the group. And the three questions are, what is going on here in this picture? Second question, what do you see that makes you say that? And the third question is, what more can we find? And that's all they do. They simply facilitate asking those questions and create this environment where the person has to actually 
create the knowledge, use their own experience, use their own context in order to, to uh, learn mm -hmm. instead of, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to tell you about this painting and why it's important and significant. No, it's important that you bring your own self to that. So that's something that I was thinking about in terms of our, our bigger narrative about sense making. Love that, Scott. Thank you. That's, Thank that's you. really useful. And that's one of those kinds of tools that we can put in the mix and, and map and so forth. Uh, Jamie, Pete Kaminsky, then Pete Forsythe. Gosh, these conversations are always so rich. Thank you all so much. Um, so what I'm currently working on, the, the Society Library has wrapped up its COVID combo project. Um, we've downsized the team temporarily to focus on reworking the information processing pipeline because we found all these inefficiencies that could be made more automated. So we're working on that. And what I'm very excited about recently um, is we're working on our style and our storytelling and finding the right metaphors to talk about issues. So the angle that we're going for, um, given that some other people in this arena have been really good at telling stories about like the power of technology and how that manipulates minds and things like that, that seems to be like taken care of by a good group. What we're looking to find are the metaphors and stories that can help describe how our capitalist context and how our democratic ideals are impossible to like, fun like cannot function cannot really function because it relies on the premise that individuals are rational. And we want to talk about how like the overwhelming number of cognitive biases and logical fallacies really prevent people from intuitively and um, automatically being rational agents. So we've been trying to map metaphor, like the metaphor of food seems to map on the best because the, the dimensions in which we can describe food and how we grow it and where it comes from and how we transport it and what it's made out of and how we consume it and what it does for us really maps well onto an information diet. So where does this information come from, from where it was grown, what, you know, how nutritious is it, yada, yada, yada. So we're trying to find these stories and metaphors so we can describe how humanity's relationship with information is so incredibly important to participating in these ideals of social structure, like a capitalist economy or democracy, stuff like that. Um, and then Society Library also got a brand new facelift on the website, which I'm also really excited about. It's still in the works and we still have other things to do, but I'm really excited to be moving into um, a design stage because not only is the tech team working on the information processing pipeline, but we have this data architecture for our climate change content and for COVID. And what I really want to start working on is how can different data structures be visualized in different ways. And design is kind of something that I really, really love to do. So I've been working on that. And all of this is in service of getting back out there to fundraise to complete our climate change debate maps. So for anyone here who hasn't already heard, uh, the Society Library, which is the nonprofit I work for, we've been mapping the US climate change debate. And we found that there's about 274 subtopics of debate that Americans engage in, and each one of those corresponds to six fundamental questions. So in these six questions, there's 274 subtopics. And then of course, each one of those subtopics implies like two to four, sometimes even seven positions you could take, and then tens of thousands of arguments each. So it's a lot of work, um, but we do wanna exhaustively and comprehensively articulate the logic from all points of view on the, these climate change questions. And so that's kind of what we're up to. Wait, that's all? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Wow. Um, yeah, Charles's mind is blown. Several of ours are like, whoa, okay, you're on fire. Um, thank you. And, and uh, if you could put links in the chat so that we can go follow your work. Uh, yes. this, is, this is also extremely <laughs> ogm -y. How do we put turbo boosters on your, on your, on your Nikes? You know, that, that would be like fabulous. Um, awesome. uh, Pete Forsyth, I think we're getting some ambient noise from your mic, if you wouldn't mind muting. Uh, let's go, uh, Pete Kaminsky, Pete Forsyth, and Ken. Uh, good morning, all. <clears throat> it's great to see everybody. Um, uh, I've been having some awesome uh, two and three person uh, OGM discussions. Uh, so uh, if if folks aren't doing that with already, pick a few people that you want to talk to and just give them a call or whatever. It's it's super fun. Um, uh, CSC, uh, the Collaborative Sense Commons work I've got uh, with the information communication tools has been kind of on a back burner for a month or so, but I, I think it's moving to a front burner again, so that's exciting. Uh, OGM forum is is percolating along. There's some cool stuff going on in Free Jerry's brain. Um, and for me this week, kind of, I think, um, uh, a big 
a big epiphany or something like that for me has been um, uh, something that we see in many places, but the the person I'm I'm holding is kind of the 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 person who explained it uh, was is um, Douglas Hofstetter, um, a logician ph philosopher. Um, and he talks about the way um, people understand things is by chunking them into small enough bite-sized pieces kind of, and then having the chunks. Um, he, is, he doesn't say hierarchy, he actually says recursion, but you have, you know, this chunk is inside another bigger chunk, which has got a lot of stuff going on. So, um, so in the discussion we've had about, um, about discussion on, on the OGM mailing list, um, it, it's helped me a lot to think of, meta levels of things. Um, so there's the discussion you might want to be having, and then there's discussing about how you might have that discussion. And then there's discussion about how you might have the discussion about having the discussion, um, which I know gets st stupid for most everybody really fast, but for better or worse, there's a few of us who are really into it. Um, and most particularly, I can come back around from all that theory about meta stuff and meta meta stuff, and meta 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 stuff and go, you know, there's discussions that you want to have and discussions you don't want to have. And if if one person thinks they're in one meta level and the other person thinks they're in, in a different meta level, you're just going to be annoyed with each other. So finding the the meta level where you're talking about stuff. I want to be talking about carbon, you know, carbon change, um, or I want to be talking about the tools for talking about carbon change. Those are completely different discussions, even though they're related. And you're just going to piss each other off if you're in the wrong one. So. And this ties back a lot to several people have brought up spiral dynamics in our conversations, and that's about you know matching levels. Uh, Neil, who can't make this call, uh, it talks a lot about you know creating sort of a vertical space for different levels of activity. So th th there's a lot of us are trying to figure out how to do that, and I I'd love to figure out how practically to do that, uh, so that we have some language and some tools around it. Thanks, Pete. Well, there's also the, the ability to freely move between those different dimensions, Pete, in the conversations. And some people can just flow with the shift to different portions of the agenda, and others sort of tend to stay in a track. Um, it's a and great if observation. That's the case, if that's the case, then that's part of the uh, disconnect that can yeah. be disharmonious, for sure. Yeah. Judy, can you, can you say that again? Maybe uh, just can you elaborate on that just a little bit? Um, I think there's a human dimension that has to do with the nimbleness of moving from one domain to another and shifting levels. And there are individuals who, for whatever reason, have came with that entity or developed or procured that entity because it worked for them. And so if you're in a conversation with them and it changes from level A to level B, they can go with it and they'll just start relating on level B and you'll have another continually evolving expansive conversation and to some extent that's what's OGME about this group but there's also um, even within any group there are individuals who aren't as nimble moving between those layers or those threads I'm not I'm not sure it's fair to say layers because that implies hierarchy and it's really just difference but it's a there's if you're more in a stay in a thread mode then it's not nimble to move to another one and there's a disconnect in the conversation. I'm not sure I made that better, Jay. I think I made it worse by talking too much, but. <laughs> good no, that was, it did, no, it was, I mean, it was helpful. And part of it was I was kind of fast switching between where, where some of Doug's information was and something else. So I, I missed one piece, but that now that you've restated it, I'm, I'm tracking. And I, I, I do think that this level shifting, um, or this ability to move across vantage points and move through vantage points, you know, to nest, you know, the move up and down, frac, you know, the kind of the whole ons and stuff. It's really it, fractal. Yeah, it, I mean, it's 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 an essential skill of synthesis that I think is often missed, you know, from the the linearity of the way that we teach things, right? I was just going to make that statement. I think the the difference between learning and education is the linear and the fractal. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm um, and Jerry, you're, you talk about this in terms of you have one brain that everything is mapped together, right? Um, and there, there's these links and, and, and I'll come to it in my checkup, but I'm trying to introduce a client of mine into a convert. They've asked me to 
to talk to them about how to influence change in their organization, right? And we're struggling because every time we get into the conversation, they want to say, well, we, we, need to, we need to start here. And then it keeps backing up and backing up, backing up versus where I want to go, which is you need to move into and connect dots and build knowledge and move across multiple levels to get to a place where you understand enough to change your, your mental models. And it's ways in are very difficult. You know, and I think it's like, how do you get an on a, a linear on ramp, but then into, you know, the kind of this place of multiplicity? So, just a just a question. Love that, and just a riff on what Judy um, put in the room a moment ago. Um, the ability to step to um, see different perspectives on the sets of issues is also key to empathy. And one of the one of the interesting, important things to do is to have people put themselves in other people's shoes and see the world through their eyes, if at all possible. And one of the things I'd love to figure out how to do is to help make those other persons, the scripts running inside their heads, make them more visible, more accessible, more testable, more adoptable. <clears throat> because we can pretend to know what somebody, what a what somebody who just lost their job in Indiana feels like, uh, who attends a, a Pentecostal church, who listens to you know AM talk radio all the time, we can pretend to, to put ourselves in those shoes. And as a human, I can pretty easily feel empathy for their situation, and 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 that's that's not a problem. But seeing through their eyes is extremely difficult. So how do we make the scripts that are running in their heads more accessible? And here I keep going back to the, the, the Dave Gray's explain cards, his, his little diagnostic deck that he would hand to potential corporate clients where each card, and I've got a, I've got a deck of them here, I, I can go find them, but where each card has something, you know, is this, is, this a, is this a thing that's happening in your organization where, you know, we don't know what the facts are or we're triangulating a lot. We tell people things to tell other people things or whatever. And then you just sort the cards into, into two stacks. And then the, the stack of things that are yeses are the places to start your conversation with that person. And that was just a, a corporate diagnostic tool for how to walk into a consulting engagement. But I can, I can also easily see that there might be a personality profile or, a, or some other kind of thing where you work your way through a series of, of, of scripts and go, yeah, this is me, no, this is not me. And at the end of the day, making those visible, if maybe only to yourself, but maybe to everybody else would be useful. And in my brain, I have something I call my belief snapshot. Uh, so I have, a, I have a thought called my beliefs, which is always pinned at the top. It's very messy right now because it's full of too many things. But one of the things it connects to is that people are born good. And that's just an assumption I make. That's part of my little frame of thinking. It's perfectly legit to think people are born somehow evil or one down. You know, original sin is basically people are born one down. Like you show up in the world and you need healing. You need, you need to reconnect with God kind of thing. And I'm like, that's, that's invented. I don't like, I get that someone would have invented that because it's a really useful crowd control technique, but I'm not buying. And that informs the rest, a, a lot of the rest of things like assume good faith, right? And, and so how do we make more of this available to ourselves by, as a form of introspection for people to figure out what they think and how they think it and how to express it, but as a, as a form of getting us together to, to, to do not just idea sex, but rather uh, empathy and point of view comprehension and sort of dissolve into each other more in some way. And I think, I think we're, we're not doing that. We're busy sort of, we're busy having combat out in the sphere of ideas. And then we're, we're, you know, cancel culture is wiping people off the map when they say something wrong or do something wrong so that freedom of expression is kind of constrained in different ways. And we're not respecting everybody or feeling empathy for them. In fact, we're, we're, we're getting angrier and angrier as things go. So I think Biden has his hands full. Uh, is, is a weird way to wrap this little, this little riff on things. Uh, so let me go at, someone just held up their hand. Was it Doug? Yeah, uh, do you wanna comment on that? Well, yeah, very quickly. Um, I think that uh, when people are thinking, their thoughts are surrounded by a sea of anxiety and it keeps them from wanting to go anywhere except to the safe stones that they already know. And we've got to learn how to handle that kind of anxiety in the relationship to thought. Couldn't agree more. <clears throat> For those of you who recognize this, this is the control room from Inside Out, the movie about emotions. That's really, really good. So. I think the people... simplicity, 
I was just going to say the simplicity of Scott's three questions in terms of really opening up the learning process may be the key to that because it takes the emphasis off of responding to me and takes it internal to the person to do something. And if you follow the link I put in the chat around BTS, you'll see those questions and some other stuff mapped in my brain. I had forgotten I'd put that in. So Scott, thank you for re reloading that in, in my wet brain um, because that's really important stuff. So uh, Pete Forsyth, Ken, Matt. Good morning. Uh, I'm sorry for that, uh, that audio problem. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're just fine. No, yes, okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. I'm, I was trying to get the phone computer link going and hit it, it wasn't happening for you. Yeah, well, it is now. <laughs> um, anyway, I, um, I'm sorry to join late. And if there's a specific prompt, I feel like I have some, a couple of points that tie in with what people are saying. But if there was a specific prompt, I missed it. The prompt is just that this is a check-in call. So every Thursday just morning, check -in. Okay. we're just sort of saying, yep. what's ODM in our lives? Or have we made progress on the things we yep. talked about last time? That kind of thing. So it's totally appropriate what you're Great. saying. OK. Um, so, so the first thing, uh, you know, just kind of just on the topic, I guess, of, of uh, misinformation and what do we do about it, uh, the, the, the two things that are, and, and, and I, I, I might touch on the, the empathy bit as well. Um, the, the first thing that's on my mind is the uh, well. I'm I'm in Portland. I think like Jerry and maybe others on the call, um, and uh, I've been pretty um, consumed by and uh, to, and involved in the the uh, racial justice profile uh, protests here. And there was a movie that just came out. Uh, it was briefly available for free streaming online just for a couple of days. They're still figuring out their distribution. Um, so I posted that. Actually, Charles posted that, I think, on my behalf of the list. I guess I put it in the Telegram channel and Charles uh, forwarded it along. It actually led to a, um, a really interesting conversation that mostly went off the list with uh, uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn McGrew, I think is his name on the list. Um, so I mean that just really has me. It's been it's been a challenging movie to watch and absorb and share with people outside of town and in town. Um, you know it's it, it's a it's a documentary that like a tremendous amount of work clearly went into it. Um, they had seventeen in depth interviews with a variety of people that kind of anchored it and a lot of footage. Um, and and they put it together. You know I think their interviews took place in August. So they put together a pretty high production value, you know, hour and a half documentary in, in just a few months, which is kind of mind boggling. Um, but, and so, you know, I want to respect that. And at the same time, there are so many places in it where it feels like it missed the mark or is conveying a narrative that sort of reinforces stuff that I'm already bummed out that my friends outside of Portland are getting through the national media, um, that kind of thing. You know, there are things that I think it gets really, really right. And probably the, the, the biggest issues, I think it really gets right. Um, but it's just, it's hard to process and watch. And I've been, in a way, I've been enjoying that process. And in a way, that process has been stressing me out. It's really been um, gratifying to have several people in my life outside of Portland that it was the thing that they sat down and watched and like, and, and gave an hour and a half of their attention to what's going on here. Um, and, and, you know, and are like, are that much more open to reflecting on it. Um, but it puts me in a place of, of sort of wondering how to work my kind of on the ground, direct experience, anecdotal experience uh, into uh, sort of helping a narrative get closer to something that feels like the truth to me. Uh, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a, you know, I've dabbled in journalism. I'm not a journalist, I'm not an academic. Um, so, you know, the, in a lot of ways, there's sort of like data based approaches that are important, but also in a lot of ways that there's, there's a lot of knowledge that, that, uh, that data can never really capture, right. That, that, that like, that really has to do with having human perception and being in the right place at the right time. And and you know having having uh, some kind of empathy skills and and I should also say like I'll just just briefly like right now I'm 
I'm struggling a little bit in in uh, a group of folks that I, I work with around the protests around some issues of empathy and uh, trusting each other uh, around racial racial justice issues and and um, and sort of how to how to be in that group. So uh, yeah, kind of challenging all around. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to to mention, I don't remember if I've mentioned on this call before. I probably did when I first got into it, but I'm now in the midst of an in-depth uh, a six month campaign um, to add information about local newspapers to Wikipedia. Um, so this is a, a project that is very much uh, designed to combat the underlying uh, causes of the spread of misinformation and empower people to make quick assessments where they're already looking, meaning Google searches, which are informed by Wikipedia content. Um, you know, to help people at the moment when they're wondering, is this a real source? Is this something that I should trust? Uh, rather than trying to force them to come to a separate place to get that information. Um, and uh, we're, we're putting together a uh, probably our, you know, sort of biggest push public call edit-a-thon. Uh, it's going to be on December 12th. So if people are interested in that, maybe mark that on your calendar. I'm, I'm sure I'll put the announcement in the OGM channels. Um, but it's, I think, a great opportunity to learn a little bit about Wikipedia and also to kind of pitch in on a campaign that I think is, is important. Hey, thank you. That's awesome. Um, I think social justice issues are really central here. And, and, and I want to create a pop-up call um, to try to describe how we might form ourselves up around some of these things, because we have, we have diversity questions here that are really important. And I think that the way to do that is not to recruit more diverse people in, but to serve more diverse people and to be of service to groups that could really use our help and they could really use our help. And their hands are full. Their hands are really quite full. Um, so, so I'd like to sort of focus on that and see what that might turn into. Um, well, as you were talking, I was thinking also yesterday and the day before, there were a couple stories of, of nurses in intensive care units who have people who are dying of COVID who don't believe they have COVID until they die like right to their dying breath. They're like, this is, there's no way this is COVID. COVID is a hoax. I must be having a heart attack or something else. Uh, and that's just, it's just deeply saddening, right? As it goes. And then I put a, I, this may seem like a non sequitur, but <clears throat> you're talking about local news and local newspapers. I put an article called the Substack Arati in there because a whole lot of journalists are leaving me, mainstream media and going off on their own and making a living from paid newsletters. It's a very simple model. It's like, hey, you write a newsletter, people subscribe to you. It's sort of like it, it's like using Medium and going to Patreon, except that the whole thing is glued together <clears throat> in one in a very old fashioned model. But um, a, real, a lot of very smart authors are leaving mainstream publications and small publications and actually are completely, it's like the number of people who are gonna be able to make a living from this could be large. And so hyperlocal media, which was a thing like 10 years ago might morph into highly credible voices and some crazy voices who get paid to have personal, very personal newsletters that are well-informed, well-written. And if we do our job well, <clears throat> more contextualized and better woven into everything else that's out there, uh, that could be super interesting. So I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in sort of the future of journalism and news, how we hear about events that happen, what we consider a fact and not a fact. So this, this tumbles back into 15 other interesting issues. Go ahead, Pete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, the 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 first place my mind goes with that topic, uh, you know, kind of as a Wikipedian, as someone who who tries to process information through the lens of trusted sources, um, is uh, is how are the librarians gonna handle that? You know, now and in twenty years, and it, you know, how like librarians who 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 have the the unenviable task of of kind of making sure that the most credible or mainstream voices, I don't know if I chose maybe not the right words there, but that the most important voices are captured and made available uh, for the long term. Like if things are sort of distributed into a bunch of self-produced newsletters, that becomes a, and it's, I mean, that's, that's true of so much of our media these days is that with things kind of splintering off, it's a much more complicated. Um, task than it than it used to be it, it and, be, and we rely on that task being done well we all yeah. rely on that yeah it would be really really fun to think through how to help librarians because 
if this works well, librarians become our coaches for making sense of the world locally, <clears throat> right? Because it used to be that yeah. they would help us find the right books or research documents to support whatever quest we were on, whether it's a science fair project or whatever, or I need to, you know, I'm looking for some good novels for, for fireside reading during the winter. But, but in some other way, librarians can be um, a, a core because thanks to Andrew Carnegie, who was making up for other evils in his life, <clears throat> we have public libraries all over the country. Um, which are trying to sort out what to do in the pandemic and what to do in the internet and what to do in all these things. But, uh, but librarians uh, could easily be sort of the, the leading edge of, of sense-making um, everywhere. And I think, they would, I would think they would completely understand sort of this, uh, this what, what set, uh, some piece of what we mean by sense-making. And then another part of it would be blocked by their notion of what librarianism means and, and their training and so forth. Uh, Scott, then from you. Um, simple comment relates to last week. I think we were talking about context and the difference between Jerry's brain and Jerry and how Jerry is the guide for Jerry's brain, right? And the idea that the librarians are replications of Jerry throughout the world and the libraries are Jerry's brain and the sense that I think we've left too many people to the idea that all the answers are out there. You just have to go get them. And that's, that's not helpful. For most people. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. Uh, Parmji? Um, okay. Uh, somebody was talking about um, Wikipedia um, just a while ago, and um, I've just put in the chat Chad O, Chad o times one. Now, this is something interesting because um, I saw a, a video of somebody with packaging for um, the AstraZeneca vaccine. And on there, it had that, um, w whether it's a chemical or whatever it is. Well, okay, Pete, cool. Um, and then, so they were saying that what they did was they looked up in Wikipedia what that was. And then they gave us the definition of what Wikipedia was saying it was, and it was something to do with breaking down um, your RNA and da da da, and so it didn't like feel like it was very good news because it's messing about with your DNA and what have you. And so then I went to have a look in Wikipedia to see what it says. And do you know what? They'd moved. They'd just removed it completely, and they had just put the link instead of reading about that. Um, they had just put general information about vaccines. So stuff about like librarians and everything is great up to a point, but we're still having information withheld that isn't deemed you know, good for us to know. Two, two short comments and then I'll turn it over to Pete who probably knows a whole lot more than me by, by orders of magnitude. One is uh, the Wikipedia is always reorganizing itself. So it could be that a specific thing winds up in the category basket or winds up moved around because this is how we do things on Wikipedia so that sort of gets sorted around. But it sounds like the detail you were looking for got lost altogether. So Yeah, so they maybe... replaced the whole link with a link that was generalized information about the vaccine with no but... reference to that actual specific thing. Of what was happening, yeah, to that specific genome. It looks like a, a, an address of a genome or something like that. Um, and then second thing is, because there is one Wikipedia, even though there are forks and there's all, all, all sorts of things happening around it, and it, you know, Wikipedia is its own thing, but because it's centralized and there is one, it is a battleground. And, and every now and then they you know, Wikipedia has to lock certain pages because there's too many fights over what to put on the page. So they have to wait until the, the steam around the issue, you know, until some controversial thing sort of dies down. So the, the fact of its centrality and the fact that it's almost always among the 10 most visited websites in the world uh, means that it has become this battleground for what is truth, uh, right? Along with Snopes, which is completely overwhelmed along with a few other, a few other websites. So I don't, I don't Pete, if you wanna riff on that, but, you know, I, I think that probably describes some piece of your reality in the last, uh, last decade. Oh, sure, just... yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I can, uh, uh, Pamjit, uh, I, did I say your name right? 
Yeah, I, uh, I I can't comment too specifically on the on the particular example you gave. Obviously, I don't I don't really know the the details of it, but I can comment on the phenomenon a bit. Um, it, you know, I, I I think in in terms of really setting the table for that, I think Jerry did a nice job of that. And I would I would say that Wikipedia started off as something that had big aspirations, but um, little reason to believe that it would be, you know, for any of the people involved to believe that it would be anywhere near the scale of influence uh, and ubiquity that it's, that it's come to. Um, so in a, in a way, you could look at the early days of Wikipedia as kind of a, you know, a bunch of friends, you know, new friends, people who had met each other through the internet, but a bunch of friends just trying to make, make sense of the world and, and kind of keep that information uh, available to each other and, and the world. And, you know, as it, the, the process that Jerry described, as it became sort of the one central place that is a useful guidepost, even not, even if it's not 100% reliably accurate, that's useful in navigating your way towards other information, um, the importance of getting it right has really increased. Um, and Wikipedia's processes have, uh, have, have adapted to some degree to meet that need. Uh, but in other ways, I think the, the 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 problem is very difficult to do. I mean, if if the whole way that you scale is by bringing in more and more people and having them do more and more stuff that's outside their expertise, um, there are going to be problems associated with that where where people don't necessarily make the right judgment. Um, you know, so so I think you know with a with a case like you describe uh, like you described, um, I. I think the most important thing is for as many people in the world as possible to have a basic sort of uh, grounding in Wikipedia literacy, like to, to sort of, you know, understand the basic mechanics of how things move around on it and how decisions are made. So that when something like that, that happens, that's in an area you really care about, that, that, that you have the ability yourself to look at the talk page, to look at the uh, you know, just, you know, if there was a discussion about deletion or if there's an edit history behind the person who made that decision to figure out who it was that made that change and have they been focusing all of their attention on articles just like that or are they mostly writing articles about basketball players and this was a weird little side edit like, um, you know, to kind of to to number one to sort of build your own understanding of what happened and number two, if you want to to be able to step in and make your own comment and make your own argument for how you think things should be. Um, so, you know, but I, I really, I, I do feel a little bit like a voice in the wilderness in emphasizing the importance of, uh, of, of, of just understanding how Wikipedia works. The, um, the, the software features that were designed primarily for editors of Wikipedia with the idea of that anybody could be an editor are also really useful to more motivated readers. And it's a much, much lower bar to kind of learn what the tools are in Wikipedia that help you get that basic sense of what's going on around you than to actually ask you to actually, you know, become an invested editor and write articles and, and things like that. And I, I really just wish that we could get better integrated into schools and libraries and, and things like that on that level of, you know, it can be an entry point to people becoming an editor, but I think that it's a much easier thing to accomplish to, uh, to help people just get a basic grounding. Thank you so much. That's super useful. Pete Kaminsky. Um, uh, that's a, it's a really good, I, I don't know. It's an, an interesting observation for it, um, and, and useful, I think. And, and, and interesting to talk about maybe in this group too. Um, so to, to, you know, to first order one way of thinking of Wikipedia is like, it's, it's kind of a crowdsourced Encyclopedia Britannica, right? And the crowdsourced part of it means that it's a little bit worse in some ways because there aren't like uh, professional editors getting paid lots of money to make sure that kind of the information is accurate. But on the other hand, it's crowdsourced. So you get a lot more information than you could ever fit into the bandwidth of, of the Encyclopedia Britannica production process. But so that's one way you can kind of think about Wikipedia. And maybe that's, you know, the kind of the general, like since it has PD in the name and since it is actually amazing re information resource, that's maybe a, a 
primary way we think about it. Another way to think about it is Wikipedia is basically a battleground for uh, understanding uh, and sharing information. So um, if you think about uh, facts and concepts that aren't very controversial, they kind of get put up and they get vetted a little bit and it sticks. For things that have more controversy or things that are evolving more rapidly, um, uh, especially controversial things, it actually gets into a pitched battle, literally a battle, where people are going back and forth, no, it means this, no, it means that, right? So um, everybody's fighting for their own truth instead of for kind of neutral facts in the middle. And um, Wikipedia, to kind of pick up something that Pete uh, F. said, um, it's super amazing to really get to understand the complexity of the bureaucracy that Wikipedia manages that battleground with. And they're doing this amazingly effective job for them in the main of keeping the thing generative and useful and informative and, you know, on, on to first order, mainly correct, mainly relevant and things like that. Um, uh, the bureaucracy of that is just amazing and, and rich and deep, and it's it's actually I think um, one of the one of the beautiful most beautiful things that humans have ever done. Literally, is figuring out how we're going to to manage mm -hmm. tens of thousands of people fighting over you know what truth means right. on, on the web. So in, it's fascinating to look at, at at it in depth, and it's hard to kind of understand. And it's amazing at the scope of that. You know management of battle yeah. process essentially um yeah i think there's i i think just real briefly i, th I think it's it's i think that you know and just to to kind of amplify and, and build on what you were just saying pete um i think the the importance of wikipedia as as like really the by far uh biggest collaborative project in human history you know i, I there, there are so many sites that incorporate collaboration, um, but Wikipedia is the one that put collaboration at the center. It doesn't mean that it gets it right, but it is fascinating, I think, to see like what were the components that made it possible for tens or hundreds of thousands of people to work together towards a common goal. Um, and I, I, I really think that's an important area of study too. Cool, thank you. Just to complete our check-in round, uh, let's go Ken, Phelan, Neil, and then me. Hello, everybody. Um, nice to see you all and um, be back here again. I always appreciate this. Um, oh boy, there's been so much that's gone on here. Um, at the moment, I'm not doing very much. I just filed for unemployment. I'm going to take a little time and relax. Um, so I'm just kind of reading, trying to keep up with the, uh, the, the fire hose that is the um, uh, email thread on uh, Open Global Mind, um, which is just really amazing. Um, a couple of things I wanted to say regarding some of what's gone on this morning. Um, I find when I facilitate groups that are often in contention that uh, it's really helpful to slow things down. I think people, um, we get into conversations, we miss certain conversational literacies, like the literacy of, are we talking about, are we making I statements, what I believe, we're making we statements, of what we believe, are we making it statements of factual statements? And just having those three buckets can be really useful and paying attention to the vocabulary. So people will shift very quickly from I to we to it without actually making the distinction. So that's a really helpful thing to do is just make those distinctions people and ask them to have a conversation just using I statements and then shift now, let's look at the same thing from we statements. What do we agree on? What do we disagree on, right? And then what is a what can we say is objective about this and teasing that out um often brings about much deeper levels of understanding than we get if we're just launched into it so um that's one of the conversational literacies that i try to bring to people when i when i work with them and um i would say in general you know uh unless you're underwater without breathing apparatus or in a smoke-filled room a deep breath is almost always appropriate and taking a deep breath and slowing down and just you know like okay You've said something that that I disagree with, but let's unpack that. Let's not just you know try to fight about it. Why do I disagree? Here's why I disagree, right? And why do you see it that way? And going to Jerry's um, belief of if we assume good faith and good intent, 
then you know people see things differently for different reasons. So let's unpack why that is and make the space. I facilitated a very contentious group once where it was peace activists and business people. And I had them start by telling a story of when did you realize peace was important to you? And that created a space for people to tell a personal story that no one could argue with. And there was no longer peace activists and business people. There were a bunch of people in the room concerned about peace from very different perspectives. So shifting the focus from, you know, what is what is here to what allows this to come together into some kind of convergence that we all care about. Um, so those are my, that's my, my thoughts on, on the, the conversation so far today. And um, I will let other people go now. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, you reminded me of something I'll bring up when I check in. Uh, so let's go to Phelan and then Neil. Although Phelan's just gone on mute. Are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Cool. Um, oh, and you, it, it was you that had the background noise, but if you want to go ahead and, hey, uh, and talk hey, to sorry about that. Sorry about that. Hey, guys. It's been a while since I've actually checked in. Um, uh, I, I missed a great portion of, of this and apologize for arriving in so late. I, I guess checking in, I can say what's been on the top of heart and mind um, and hopefully it connects to what everyone has been talking about now. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll connect to what Neil and I were talking about before <laughs> arriving at this meeting, that's why we're late, um, was this idea of slowing down as we race to develop technologies and methodologies to address all of these things that are, we're confronted with, how can we play the perfect balance of slow and fast, slow enough to understand the environment that we're in, but fast enough to actually be effective. Um, yeah, that's, that's what's at heart of mine and trying to connect with people to to understand how they're addressing that. I won't take too much time. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, Neil? Thanks, Phelan, for that beautiful little segue. Um, we just had a really good heart to heart and we, we met here. So here's another example of uh, how uh, OGM helps you know, people to see each other because they can show up more authentically. Um, picking up on the slowing down, but also on the, the Dunkirk uh, example, um, the story I was just saying to, to Phelan um, is probably worth just sharing quickly here. In Australia, I used to celebrate with others in, in Australia, the World War I and World War II veterans that didn't come home at the Cenotaph. And um, last year in Australia, they had uh, where I was a Memorial Avenue and a Cenotaph and the women in uh, the local community had hand crocheted red poppies and over a thousand red poppies were put on display at the Cenotaph. And I took photographs of those. And one of my photographs has uh, a poem on, on a stick and it said, in Flanders fields. I now live in those Flanders fields. I took a photograph of a poppy in one of those fields, 200 meters from the Haverley War Cemetery. And I visited the Haverley War Cemetery, Commonwealth War Cemetery um, on, um, the uh, Remembrance Day on the 11th. There were some Belgians putting uh, uh, wreaths and flowers onto graves. And I asked, did they know these people? And they said, no, but we're a group who honor the fallen. And in this case, we're honoring the fall, fallen from this bomber that crashed nearby on D-Day. And so the connection here with D-Day and slowing down now, I leave the cemetery, walk across the road, and this is the story I was telling Phelan, I'm in a forest. 30, 40 metre high trees, autumn colours. On the ground are tree stumps that are you know, shin height. Everyone is flat, has moss on it, has fungi growing on it, and leaves on it. Even though there's a freeway 50 metres away, I tune that out, I can hear the leaves falling from the upper canopy, clicking through the layers of branches still there and sometimes landing on the branches. So the whole process is slowing down, right? 
the slowing down where the leaves have rested on, on the leaves that are fading has left a kiss of chlorophyll when they've been blown away again. So the color hasn't faded yet. So life continues. By the time it gets to closer to the ground, they're landing on the tree stumps. And this is where the goosebumps get me. There's a poem still gestating. The life from the top of the trees has landed on the altars to the dead trees. 50 metres away from where people are putting live flowers onto dead people's graves, right? And so we're not honouring this biosphere we're destroying, but we are honouring the people that were part of this organisational effort around Dunkirk. And so we somehow have to get to this point of slowing things down in nature and then composting this process. And so the story that resonated me, with me and the three hooks that I had to come in here is very much around how do we reconcile this celebration of human activity with this celebration or non-celebration of the life force which we are destroying. And then the technological solution, our quick fix, uh, the example I thought of with Phelan was the, the leaf blower. So I'm standing on a forest floor covered in leaves and the quickest answer to cleaning those up would be a leaf blower. Noisy, intrusive, very, very fast and completely ignoring the slow processes of nature falling down, recomposting, becoming soil, becoming community, becoming ecosystem. And so if we can hold those two energies, the everything looks like a leaf and I've got a leaf blower and here's how we actually use leaves to get a better community, I think we'll actually have something to move forward with. Thank you. And thanks, Phelan, for the beautiful conversation before we came. Thank you all. Wow. Neil, thank you so much. Jay, did you want to jump in? Thank you so much. That's beautiful, Neil. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd just like to, to, to attach to that um, the idea, a little reminder that um, Thanksgiving is coming. And I've really been thinking that it's really up for a reboot. Um, you know, we think about, oh, okay, this nice, here's a meal and, and, and the, you know, natives came and there was a harvest. Um, but if we slow that down um, and we imagine the first harvest and we imagine the arrival and the great journey and what it took to, to get here. I think it's really more about how are we embraced by this beautiful planet on which we live? How are we a part of it? How are we receiving the gifts of it? And, um, and how do we celebrate that instead of necessarily like um, just a let's have a great meal with family. And so since we're not necessarily having those gatherings, I just wanted to identify this might be a, a, a real moment of a Thanksgiving reboot. Thanks, Jay. Um, I, let me check in and then I'll pass it to Matt, um, who's back, awesome. Uh, and I have a bunch of things I wanna check on and I'll try to do it quickly. Uh, first, I kind of see these calls as a form of composting, although we don't slow down quite enough, but the idea that we're each putting into the call what we're working on and how we see this thing and then we're turning it over and we reflect on each other's uh, missions and ideas and all that. It's, it's just for me a, a form of mulching, composting, uh, processing all of this so that we each walk away with a, a, a more uni a slightly more harmonized vision of what on earth it is we're, we're, we're trying to do here and how we might fit into the broader, uh, the broader scheme of things. Um, then uh, when, we, when I went to Oaxaca in Mexico, my idea of Halloween was completely reset. <clears throat> because the idea of trick or treat and walking around demanding candy and you know you know doing costumes is replaced for me now by being grateful for your ancestors uh, going you know doing something to you know around them their graves with flowers and if they you know if uncle joe loved his tequila then you put a bottle of tequila on his gravesite and we actually went into uh, cemeteries on during day of the dead and, and sat with people who uh, we're celebrating their families and took some flowers of our own and sat with another couple and did our own ofrenda, it's called our own offering. So that was a, a total reframe for me for Halloween. So, Super. so I, I, go ahead, Charles. Super. If I might just quickly jump in, maybe 30 second story. I heard a podcast in, um, musician who grew up in Mexico in a very rural village um, was describing a scene on Day of the Dead where, and this was kind of off, often throughout the year, babies dying, dying um, 
uh, from lack of, of uh, health uh, healthcare. And the moms um, going through this whole parade ritual of wailing on their hands and knees, crawling through the town. And the, the family and the, and the, the sister circles um, laying out the carpets in front of her throughout, throughout the village. So, wow. Amazing image. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, back to what Neil was saying, uh, back to what we were just talking about. Also, uh, there might be a really interesting reset for Thanksgiving just around gratitude because it is called Thanksgiving. And I think, I think uh, we might actually sort of help do a little Mexican wave around uh, it just sharing, you know, being grateful in social media and whatever else and, and, and thinking through that in different ways. Ken? I want to add on to what Charles was just saying. Um, I have a friend who uh, his mother was from uh, Ukraine. And when she passed a few years ago, we went to her funeral and they had hired um, professional mourners who were wailing and crying. And it was the most moving funeral I'd ever been to. I mean, I didn't, I'd never met this woman, but I was really moved by it with a power that these three women who were all in black and they just were wailing and crying and, you know, like, it was very powerful. And then I couple that with um, some of you know that I, I've been a kind of a student of Michael Mead for many years. And Michael talks about the need for public grief rituals and how, you know, um, we will begin to heal as a culture when we reintroduce public grief into our sphere. Because right now, grief is very privatized. You do not, it used to be that you wore, you know, sackcloth and ashes and covered the mirrors and all that stuff. And, you know, people respected when, when someone had died that you, you gave them the space to be in mourning. And now it's like, nope, you know, right back to work the next day and maybe you wear a black armband and, you know, and oh, my condolences, but there's no longer this, this public acceptance acceptance of this person is undergoing sorrow. You know, we've removed public sorrow. And um, so I, I think it's really important that we get back to um, the grief that is, is just right in the other room there of the devastation of the planet of 250,000 people dead from COVID of, you know, all there's so many things to be grieved. And um, it's interesting to me that we have, you know, the, uh, the Day of the Dead at the, the beginning of October, right? I mean, excuse me, the beginning of November, All Saints Day is usually November 1st. And then um, Thanksgiving is just three weeks later. So first we grieve and then we give thanks. And we need to reboot uh, that in our lives. I think it would be really helpful. That'd be super awesome. And you just added something else to my check-in list, which is my favorite take on why Joe Biden has found his moment was an article called uh, Biden is the Emissary of Grief because like more than, much more than most humans, he has withstood and been gracious and graceful uh, inside of a tremendous amount of grief. <clears throat> and he is famous for helping anybody else on whatever side of the aisle was around him and other citizens make their way through grief. So I think that, that if he seizes that at this moment, that we're really at a place where we need some grieving and grieving could be a very unifying thing. Um, so I'll go back to my check really quick. Uh, go ahead, Charles. Just a coda, um, on Thanksgiving, it's the same calendar day here in Switzerland. It's the day where they turn on the lights, basically the holiday lights, the Christmas lights. It's a Lichterfest. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting because that's also goes with the gratitude, the, the, the return or the injection of some light in the mm -hmm. darkness. Thank you. So a couple of quick things to add to the conversation. Um, one of my favorite uh, inspiring videos from long ago is this really crappy VHS quality video about upward spiral and this guy, Paul Crafel <clears throat> in uh, Northern California, who's walking around healing the hillsides with a hand trowel. And he's basically, and, and Arthur Brock basically uh, put this video in front of me a long, long time ago. And, and he, he's basically just walking around talking about the principles of how you heal a hillside. And what you do is you try to trap water further and further uphill, because if water creates a gully, the gully cuts through the hillside, it soil erodes, the hillside degrades, the water is no longer up high on the hill, so the vegetation starts to die off. And the way you can help it is by trapping, pooling water up high. So he's with a little hand trowel, he's filling in the gullies and letting water pool. And he has pictures, you know, uh, 10 years before, 10 years after of what happens to the hillsides. And, and one dude sort of walking around doing this heals an entire part of a small part of the world. And then two months later, I found uh, a documentary about the Lowe's Plateau in China, L-O-E-S-S, -S, 
is a farm, form of loose friable soil <clears throat> where the Chinese government employed villagers in this part of China that was blowing away, causing a huge dust bowl to employ same principles at very large scale, basically re-greening this entire portion of, of uh, China that's the size of Belgium. Uh, so I, I can, the, the Los Plateau documentary is also in my brain, I can put links to it. Um, next thing is about slowing down. I realized after the election that I'd been a big fan of the Lincoln Project videos and ooh, they're making all these great ads. And it, it suddenly dawned on me that it's, it's, it's likely, and this is kind of controversial, that the Lincoln Project did not move the needle at all on the right side of the country. That they weren't listening, that what the, what the Lincoln Project was doing was entertaining the left really well. But my second aha on that was that the Lincoln Project was busy doing consumer mass marketing politics. That it was a consumer exercise to make a bunch of ads and put ads in the sphere and try to fill the sphere. And I was just reading an article about Susan Collins getting reelected and main, Manians saying, Jesus, like so much money came in here that it was just offensive. Like, like th this was clearly like somebody ganged up on poor Susan who represents us. So they voted her back in, right? And so um, I think that we need to, so there's, there's been also a couple articles about deep canvassing, which is at least, <clears throat> canvassing is usually knock on the door. Are you gonna vote? Are you gonna vote for whoever? Here's a flyer, uh, let's go. And, and if you're really smart, you've got an app that tells you what their background is and you ask a couple questions. Deep canvassing is actually slowing down and having empathy. And there's a couple other initiatives to do this. I think those are far more fruitful and preferable to me is actual governance with a small g where we are actually, where we don't have an election every four years or whatever, or two years, <clears throat> where we know where people stand because they're participating and because their opinion is in this in the public sphere that, that feels more OGME than anything else. And as we agree and disagree on facts, those become part of our fabric of decision-making and governance. Wouldn't that be even better than deep canvassing? So, that's a whole thing. And then finally, um, I'm having some super interesting conversations with a new friend named Jordan Sukut, who's created a thing called Lionsburg, which is, I, I mentioned him a little bit here. I just want to sort of prep this because we're going to set up a pop-up call to introduce Jordan to OGM because he's built, he's building a sort of uh, method where you create um, steward ownership. And steward ownership is basically a way of keeping ideas permanently in the commons, uh, of creating profitable businesses that can not be easily bought and turned into exit strategy startups, uh, of doing a bunch of different things. So I want to introduce that here because I think steward ownership might be a great method for us, a great framing for OGM to do its work in the world. And then in my last conversation with Jordan uh, yesterday, I was like, you know, you're doing the, all this incredibly great stuff around uh, ideas in the commons and so forth. And right next to that, is the actual physical commons and community land trusts and a whole bunch of ways of, of protecting where we are. And he's like, yep, exactly. And went into a whole riff on that. So, so I think that part of what uh, Jordan is trying to pioneer, and he spent five years sort of researching and framing up how to create this business model and make it work, um, is how to, how to nurture a whole series of commons that we are all involved in maintaining and secure those and make them actually work. So I'm very excited about introducing him to, to our conversations here. Uh, with that, and we're way over our 90 minutes time, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Matt if you wanna uh, check in and wrap up. And then, uh, and then a couple of us, I was gonna stay on the line with Charles afterward to, to uh, brief on something else. Charles, I don't know if you wanna stay here or if we can go to a different room, but uh, we'll sort that out too. Uh, so Matt, over to you. Um. Wow, I, 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 I don't know how all of a sudden I started to get one of the sort of be the, the anchor on, the, on these calls and stuff, but um, it's just incredible to sit here and try not to speak because I like to speak and just to absorb and, and to be a little slower. Um, what I'm working on right now, I mentioned to people is trying to design a kind of an influencer's toolkit for one of my clients and helping them to fundamentally think differently. And it's been difficult to get on ramps into things like mental models, systems thinking, um, persuasion, uh, facilitation, um, and things of that nature. But so my head's filled with a lot of, uh, a lot of this really good, um, you know, material um, on that, you know, on that influencing project. It's a pretty heavy piece of writing and documentation. So maybe at some point I'd love to set up a call and take people through it and to kind of further build out almost like a, a micro brain, if you will, on, you know, on this so that we can, you know, I'd love to collaborate with some people to, 
to to not only round out my thinking, but also to add the texture of other people's voices. Um, so that's what I'm working on. Um, I also, you guys reminded me of a of a of a project that I've I started and I need to continue it. Um, um, I, I've been sitting down with different people, you know, dinner parties and things like that. And when I get a group of people together and it's hard in COVID, I've been something, starting something called the New Holidays Project. Um, and basically what I, um, the way that it works is I say, um, we go kind of around the group um, and I can sort of send, send you this, that, that um, these can be existing or uh, kind of new, um, new ho um, newly established holidays, and these are about um, codifying our sacred beliefs, right? Um, and what would be the holidays that you would choose if you could only pick 10 of them? Um, and what would those 10 be? And when would they be in the year? And so, you know, this idea of, you know, uh, kind of some holiday that's like Day of the Dead, where we, you know, think about um, those that have come before us, someone, someone called it indigenous, you know, indigenous, you know, thinking or holiday or um, uh, to, um, to then giving gratitude for what we have, like what would those sacred beliefs be and how would we codify them into a set of holidays throughout the, the year? And maybe it's an OGME project where we actually create 10 days and we celebrate those 10 days together and we focus on one of these, you know, one of these things. So I can um, send around a little bit of the documentation, but I think that would be kind of fun to create a, a new set of rituals that bring us into, you know, those spaces that are um, defined for thinking slow. So maybe with that, um, yeah, Rum Rum Springa was one of the days that someone um, had mentioned that. Someone did that. That's so cool. I love that. Yeah, it came out of it. So we all have them, and <clears> I think if we said OGM, we had to, you know, we had to create ten of them. What would they be, um, and how would we make them, and would we reappropriate certain things like, you know. Um, you know, meanings and stuff. So I love that. And we could replace Columbus Day. We could get a lot of things fixed up here. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, and Veterans Day and Memorial Day could actually be maybe more appropriately done. And we could figure out who our actual heroes are. And I'm, I'm well, and we could also, also from an inclusion standpoint, maybe get a little bit beyond um, what's on the American bank calendar. Precisely. Um, <laughs> you know, so. And for anybody who doesn't know, Rumspringe is an Amish custom where I think when you're 18, uh, you basically get two years to go. Rumspringe means jumping around, like springen in German is, is jumping around. Uh, and you get to go drink and do whatever the hell you get. You get out of your system all the things that are not allowed in our culture. And then at the end of your Rumspringe time, you get to decide whether you come back uh, uh, so, so you, you get to come back, choose whether to come back into Amish society and stay or go. It's very cool. So imagine having a day where you get to do that every year. It's like carnival where you mask up and nobody knows who you are when you run around. Scott, go ahead. And the most significant thing I thought about that was that you choose that after you've been out as opposed to in, in other, uh, you know, religions where you are, you are indoctrinated before you get that choice, before you get that experience, you know, and, and I thought, Wow, that's really that's a great idea that you get to go have have a larger context and then and then decide. Exactly, yeah. making room for the decision, giving people a little experience for the decision, all of that. Um, any concluding thoughts? Just uh, just please, a brief, uh, just a really brief comment on on what you were saying, Jerry. Um, Oregon and I think something like a dozen or so other states no longer do celebrate Columbus Day. It is. Uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. So I, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's an important trajectory, but we're, we're on it. <laughs> well, a, a really important piece of all of this, uh, bridging the cultural divide and all that, is being able to talk about the darker side of history, um, because a, a piece of what's happening is that a whole bunch of people are really offended when you start to say something bad happened way back when. And there's plenty of reasons for it. That's a much deeper discussion. But, but, you know, and the Black Lives Matter movement then opened a let's take down the statues and let's rename the schools and streets movement, which was awesome, like lovely and way, way the hell overdue. You know, the idea that there's a dozen American forts named after Confederate generals, like the US Army, you know, Fort Hood, for example, is named after John Bell Hood, who was a, like a vicious asshole. Um, and, and like, we need to rename these places and it's okay. They'll get over it. They'll, they'll, they'll like 
find a better name for some of these we, for some we, of these ports. We might need to rename them, but we also might need to remember the names that we originally gave them so that we remember <clears throat> our history, right? And I think I think that that's part of part of the becoming more sophisticated, right? Formally known as is is important to know the journey step, not just the to 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 wipe clear the you know where we came from. And I think a, an appropriate place for memories like that is sort of a, <clears throat> a Holocaust museum kind of thing, or a, you know, like the the lynching museum in in uh, Mississippi, I think, where you know, and and then the consequences of all these actions were we named all these forts after these people, et cetera, et cetera. Because in a museum, you can then go back and reflect on history. But so. is it is it not <laughs> important though to say that like? For some people that this person died for a set of the beliefs that we held sacred at that time and now we might be evolving from those beliefs but but still to give your life in service of your sacred beliefs is a noble act it, potentially and so even if that noble act was misguided but i mean who's to say where any of us are on the right side of history so i don't know i think it's a more complicated thing than just wiping the slate clean. Um, I agree, and I wasn't suggesting to wipe the slate clean, but small example, then I'll go to Neil and then we'll come out of this call. Um, uh, uh, Cesar Chavez Street in San Francisco in the Mission District, the center kind of outlines the bottom of the Mission District used to be called Army Street. <clears throat> and it doesn't say Cesar Chavez formerly known as Army Street, right? Um, and, and maybe that's just too many letters for the sign, but Partly, it's who we're memorializing at the monument, at the street, at the school. So, if you if you went to you know <clears throat> uh, to Jeb to to Jeb uh, Stewart uh, High School, I don't know that you, when it's renamed to the the Flowering Peaks High School, I'm not sure you need to put on the front door formerly the Jeb you know Stewart High School. Um, but but the idea that Jeb Stewart existed and and gave his life for his cause and all that. Uh, is interesting and belongs someplace for sure. I don't, I don't want to Trotsky his existence, but I don't want to honor. It, to me, the naming of uh, streets and schools and the placement of monuments is what we honor in our culture. And it's a commentary on, on, on who we respect. Um, and so if somebody fought on what's clearly the wrong side, I, I, I'm not that interested in having monuments to them, right? I'm, I'm really interested in having a place where that person's life can be can be looked at and turned over and understood, and definitely not in wiping out memory of them. That's for, for sure not. And there's a degree of courage in fighting for, for the wrong causes, but I think warfare is stupid and, and ugly. And anybody who went and lost their life in a stupid war, who, you know, Colin Powell had an opportunity to stop the Iraq war. He did not need to go to the United Nations and lie. Um, and so I'm angry at Colin Powell and will die angry at Colin Powell for not having thrown his body and his career in front of a whole bunch of people who died as a, as a result of that war, $3 trillion war, right? He had, a, he had personally, I, I believe, a chance to, to step in front and say, I was supposed to tell you this, but I'm not going to. I'm going to back us off this stupid, stupid conflict. So for me, noble deaths in battle are often wasted lives. Uh, anyway, sorry, you got me on a long riff there. Uh, uh, Neil, then Julian, then we'll wrap this call. It looks like Julian has a short one. Did you want to go first, Julian? Yeah, I was going to make sure to, that, uh, to point out that some of these chains that you're talking about, for example, renaming Fort Hood doesn't go back far enough because the indigenous peoples already had a name before it was called whatever it was called. So, I'm totally on board with that. And, and the fact that we have so many uh, native names of places that don't respect and don't care about what they're doing and we had a practice briefly, I think here and in, in other calls of changing your name in Zoom to uh, what land we're on, uh, which is a lovely way of respecting that. Uh, lots, lots there. Uh, Neil, I'm smelling you might have a poem that relates to this. <laughs> I do, but I haven't got it in front of me. But, oh, um, but the, the connection here is that you know, love and grief are a couplet, right? And we, we fight for what we love and we grieve what we lost because we loved it. Um, what Phelan just said there about, um, where is it? Remembering, re-membering, putting back together, making whole again, recognizing we're on opposite sides of conflicts with somebody, otherwise it wouldn't have been a conflict. Um, the intergenerational grief that comes and is held in the families and in the bloodlines for multiple generations, the collective trauma, which are the fault lines that are now cracking in America and will crack in Europe as we increase pressures. 
you know, unless we find ways to heal these and mutually recognize the universal harms which cause these, such as genocide, and the universal interests with which we then have a noble responsibility to act on behalf of the whole to heal, we will fail. And we will fail on the same fault lines, regardless of what celebrations, regardless of what statues we have. So this is about embodiment, feeling it, you know, honoring it, loving it and grieving it as we lose it. And unless we can do that, we can't embody it and bring it forward because it's only from that deep place of deep wisdom and understanding that we can actually start to anticipate the design of something better than what's got us into all these fuck ups in the past. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Um, that seems like a nice place to wrap this call. I appreciate it. Um, thank you all for such a generative, a heartfelt, uh, important, confusing, uh, composty call. I really, I really appreciate your being here. Beautiful. Smelling. <laughs> <laughs> so. Are we having a call next Thursday? It is Thanksgiving. I don't know if people want to be. Oh, I totally not, forgot so. that it was Thanksgiving. Good point. Yeah. Um, let we'll, let's talk about that on the list. I, I I'm up for it because I I'm not traveling harvest anywhere that day. It's the harvest week. Love to have a call. Could we make it at eight instead of seven? Oh, you mean to like not wake up so early? Yeah, <laughs> that would be really <laughs> I awesome. Think, <laughs> I think we can adjust. Uh, all right, so that that sounds very reasonable. All right, thanks everybody. Take care. Have a great week. That's love. Hey, Neil. Can you hear me? <laughs>